why open source security in the first place? So usually when we think about open source, we think naturally that it provides us with availability and transparency. And many people also think that open source implies security somehow, which is actually very questionable. But what really security and transparency implies and what is really desirable, at least for users, is what I call trustworthiness. So not being a threat to the user. For example, my mobile phone might be very secure, meaning it would be difficult for the attacker to get and compromise it. However, it might still be not trustworthy because maybe the maker of my phone or maybe some other um, vendor of the software that runs there might be able to spy on me. So trustworthiness is somehow a stronger property than security. <coughs> However, as you see, open source somehow does not imply trustworthiness because we need also security for that. So how to get secure computing? Open source software, as I said, is not uh, a guarantee. Goodwill of developers. <coughs> However, how much various uh, privacy activists would like this to be uh, implication? Sadly, in real life, this is not. What actually makes secure computing secure is when, it's, when the software and hardware is designed and implemented by skilled workforce. So how do we get skilled people for our projects or products? So if we look at the incentives for developers, for good developers, they would usually be intellectual challenge and appreciation, sometimes called narcissism. Let's not be afraid of that. That's also money. Uh, so how do we get money? And here we face a problem for our open source projects because availability, which is implied by something like GPL license, is not really quite compatible with capitalism because we need scarcity, which is quite the opposite of open source. And the problem of scarcity in the context of security well, it, it raises some problems because uh, is it ethical to offer just half of the security to non-paying user and more security to more paying user? Anyway, how can we create scarcity for, for our projects? Um, there are traditional models here like uh, support or services. So lots of talks here, I think all the talks that I heard here all focus on the server side or the, <coughs> the backend side. And this is really nice because you can think of millions of different services which we can provide even though your software stack might be open source. With clients, this is a bit more challenging because the, the software is on the client and your service, the value of your service is the actual software that the user uses. The user doesn't really need any additional software. This is especially pronounced uh, when we think about privacy slash security slash trustworthiness projects because usually users do not want any services. Services They don't want to be forced to buy any services. So another way is to create extra features. For example, for KubeOS, we have also support for running Windows-based uh, VMs, that might be an additional paid feature. However, this requires lots of effort to develop this feature. So a more tempting from the business point of view is to superficially limit uh, features in the additions to non-paying users, which again is a question, what do you limit? And specifically in the context of operating system, which is what KubeSOS is, it's a new operating system, meaning you install it instead of Windows or instead of Mac or even instead of Ubuntu or Debian. If we look at the life cycle of such an operating system, uh, we see that for the project to succeed, we first need to get lots of users. If we have lots of users, we can attract some funding, maybe from guys like we just saw before. And then having lots of funding, we can develop some additional new features see the previous slide, which we can now start commercializing 
by offering those externalized features to, the, to those users. Unfortunately, the problem is that if we consider something like a new operating system, in order to get new users, we already need to have a very high level of polish of the new system that the user would like to migrate to and uh, impressive set of cool new features. And by the way, security itself or even privacy by most people is not perceived as a feature. But you can say some, some do it anyway and succeed somehow and uh, Signal that was mentioned here earlier is, is, a, is a good example. I'm not aware if they have any business model or if they are self-sustained, but they have very large user base. And this is an application that offers essentially security and privacy. However, if you look how people get to use Signal or similar apps, apps being the key word here, is that this is just a few clicks from, for them. They go to the App Store, they click install, and it's on their phone. And whenever they feel like, like in a mood for it, they can, they can start using it. Or maybe not using it. Maybe they will not like it, they will just continue using their other messaging apps or whatever else. Now, with a new operating system like, like Cubes, Unfortunately, this is much more com com complicated because the user first needs to get a separate new laptop. Then needs to install an operating system there. Then need to check if it all works. Then needs to learn the whole new paradigm behind this new approach to, to personal computing. And then needs to migrate essentially uh, his or her digital life from the previous operating system, previous computer to this new computer. And sometimes here it might be a loop. So this is like, so this is like, so this is like, like orders of magnitude more sacrifice from the user to go to cubes versus just trying out and possibly starting using some other security privacy application. So um, there's a company that does something similar conceptually to what we do with CubesOS. It's called Bromium. However, Bromium is not a separate operating system from the user point of view because you install it on top of Windows. So from the user point of view, it's like a security enhancing app. They also don't provide as much isolation as we do on Cubes. And yet, this company already got over 100 million of dollars of funding. We, on Cubes, got half a million dollars of funding from Open Technology Fund. And this is just uh, laughable, right? This amount. How are we expected to do a new operating system that potentially might attract new users to move from their existing operating systems, even if this is Ubuntu, so I'm not saying Mac OS users. No, just Ubuntu. The, the amount of polish and the amount of uh, attractive attractiveness, feature-wise and, and polish-wise, must be comparable to something like at least Ubuntu, and this requires extreme amount of work, which, as I said previously, requires huge investment, which we cannot get because we don't have users. So we get to the vicious circle, right? And this vicious circle would actually work assuming only people actually care so much about security and privacy because otherwise they would continue using Mac. Because why not? It's nice, it's nice hardware, it looks sexy. And so, so why should we care? We should care probably because all these um, because all these all these nice protocols, all this decentralization of the internet, um, all these crypto protocols, blockchain and stuff. This all makes sense from the security point of view, and integrity so from the confidentiality and integrity point of view. It only makes sense 
If the endpoint devices, our personal computers, like, like laptops and phones, if, they, if we can guarantee or, we, or if we can reasonably be sure that they are not compromised, but if we look at the state, how our uh, uh, mainstream operating systems, the security of the mainstream operating systems, this is just laughable. They are not secure. I, I, I see um, the security and trustworthiness of personal or endpoint devices as a fundamental challenge that every, any other innovation in this field needs to uh, be based on. Thank you.